if one looks at today's governance problems, at country level, between countries, or at uh, multilateral governance in the world, uh, we face a terrible lack of trust. Lack of trust between peoples and governments and political establishments, lack of trust between countries, and lack of trust in relation to uh, global multilateral governance institutions. Looking at country level, it is clear that globalization that has been an enormous progress together with the uh, technological uh, development. Globalization brought uh, a huge increase in wealth, uh, reduction in absolute poverty uh, in our world, uh, improved welfare in general, but globalization has its losers. And we have the rust belts of this world. And lots of people that feel that they were left behind and that the political establishments of their countries have not taken care of them. On the other hand, we see the inability uh, to handle problems related to the movements of people, to migration, refugees, uh, then the linkage that is made with terrorism, the, films, the feelings of insecurity, anxiety, and also uh, this sense that governments are not taking good care, not being able to handle it properly. We see youth. Youth that is the potential of mankind, but youth uh, with, in many countries, terrible problems in relation to the capacity to find hope, to find jobs, even if they are educated, creating enormous frustrations. And all this generates uh, in a context where also political systems have not been able to adapt to the new changes in the communication and the information technologies. This has uh, generated a gap between public opinions, societies, and governments that uh, is why is today one of the factors that undermine governance. And then if we associate it in several societies with corruption and other problems, we understand that we have a serious problem to handle. Now, it is clear that uh, reform is needed to reconcile people with political establishments. Political establishments need to be able to adapt to the new technologies, information and communication, need to be able to empower citizens and to empower young people. And uh, I am a strong believer uh, in a German philosopher, Habermas, for whom the, the, the key element of democracy is the permanent intercommunication between the political society and the civil society, and the fact that the civil society influences the decision-making process in the political society. Now with technology, this has changed. And governments have not been able to adapt to the changes in technology that force this interaction for participation to have a different nature. And reform, creating the conditions for governments to interact in a modern way to societies, is, I think, a crucial area of reform that is needed. And bringing with it the empowerment of youth and the capacity of young people to have a say in the destiny of their own countries. Improving governance and improving the relationship of confidence between governments and people is essential. And it is a condition to improve confidence in the relations between countries. We live today in a world that is no longer multipolar, no, there's no longer bipolar, no longer unipolar, but it's not yet multipolar, it's rather chaotic. Uh, a world in which power relations are not clear, in which unpredictability and impunity tend to proliferate everywhere and in which there is a deep mistrust between countries and groups of countries that, of course, facilitate the multiplication of conflicts and the difficult to solve them. We need a surge in diplomacy for peace. We need to be able to uh, have honest brokers trying to bring together those countries that are essential for the solution of the crisis we face in different parts of the world, and namely in this region. But we need to be able to address the root causes of conflict and to have the international community organized to address the root causes of conflict. And that is where the other gap of confidence becomes extremely important. In a world we never, in which everything is global, in which the problems are global, from climate change to the movement of people, um, it, there is no way countries can do it by themselves. We need global responses. And global responses need global multilateral institutions able to play their role. But for that, it's also important to have confidence in relation to global multilateral institutions. And there, there is also a lack of confidence that is obvious. If you look at the UN, for instance, there is a clear lack of confidence in the Security Council today. And a clear perception the Security Council no longer corresponds to the logic of today's world in relation to what the world was after the Second World War, when the Security Council was built. 
it is clear that many international organizations lack the efficiency, the uh, capacity to respond effectively to the problems they face. Uh, we saw the difficulties handling the global financial crisis. There is a need also for deep reforms in relation to global institutions. Reforms uh, uh, that have to do with power relations, namely in the case of the Security Council or uh, the way votes are distributed in international financial institutions, but also reforms that we need to introduce in all aspects of what we do. And in relation to my own role in the Secretariat of the UN, I'm deeply committed to three ways of reform that I consider essential. First, to adapt our peace and security strategies, operational setups, and the institutions within the UN to be much more effective. Uh, we have today 70 to 80 percent of our budget in peacekeeping operations, most of them in areas that is, where there is no peace to keep. If you want to make prevail prevention and sustaining of peace, we need to link peace and security with sustainable and inclusive development, and to make sure that the two, together with the improvement of human rights situation in the world, guarantee that the root causes of conflict are addressed. And for that, we need to reform our own way to do business in the UN. A second is the management reform. We have rules and uh, 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 regulations that make the UN very difficult to act effectively. I think sometimes they were conceived exactly to paralyze the institution. We need to create a win-win confidence building capacity uh, among different member states, Western Group, G77, all the others, to make them understand that it's in the benefit of everybody to have a, a UN that is more nimble, more decentralized, uh, with much more simplified procedures. And then we need to make sure that we reform the UN development system. And you are in one of the poles of uh, the global development in the world, Dubai. Uh, we have to recognize that we are still fragmented, that we are still unable to fully coordinate our action, and especially that the accountability in the UN system needs to be much strengthened. So to reform the UN development system, strengthening coordination and accountability and making all organizations work together and being able to support governments in implementing the different crucial objectives that were approved uh, last year, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement in relation to climate change, and different other aspects of the international cooperation in relation to development are uh, areas in which the reform in the UN is absolutely crucial to better sustain those processes. Reform at country level, reform in the way countries deal with each other and international organizations operate, Reform in our multilateral governance system are crucial to establish trust, and without trust, I don't think we'll be able to address the very difficult challenges the world faces today. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes to chat, um, so let's um, deal with this deficit of trust, as you have described it. And let's really drill down and take an early example of that in your very own institution at the beginning of this term. And I'm talking the, the US decision to block uh, Salam Fayed, your pick to become the new UN envoy for peace in Libya. For too long, the UN has been unfairly biased, said the US ambassador, unfairly biased in favor of the Palestinian Authority to the detriment of our allies in Israel. How do you deal with that? And what happens next? No, uh, there are two different questions here. One mm -hmm. is the appointment of uh, um, uh, Mr. Salam uh, Fayez uh, mm -hmm. as uh, high representative uh, for mm -hmm. Libya. And I believe he is the right person for the right job at mm -hmm. the right moment. He has qualities uh, that are recognized everywhere. He has a competence that nobody denies. Mm -hmm. And Libya uh, requires the kind of capacity that he has. And I think it's a loss for the Libyan peace process and for the Libyan people mm -hmm. that I'm not able to appoint him. And um, it is uh, very important to underline that nobody in the UN represents a government or a country. People in the UN have just one area of loyalty they need to respect. It's the UN Charter. And so I deeply regret this opposition, and I do not see any valid reason for it. Mm. Having said so, I think the UN needs to be able to act with impartiality in all circumstances mm. and cannot be biased in favor of anybody. Things need to be dealt based on the real face value of things. Mm. 
And so uh, I think that if Israel does something with, in relation to which we disagree, we need to express that disagreement. But that doesn't mean that Israel needs to be discriminated uh, on all other areas. So I think we need to distinguish things. I'm very much in favor of a UN that is impartial, that addresses the problems based on the value of the problems and, uh, and what the problems require to address them. But uh, I do not think that there is any valid reason to avoid someone that is very competent uh, to do a job that is extremely important in a dramatic moment. And let's not forget that Libya is not only relevant in itself. Mm -hmm. Libya has been a factor of um, contamination of the peace and stability in a wide uh, area, namely in Africa, in the Sahel. Mm -hmm. And to bring an end uh, to the conflict in Libya is in everybody's interest. Let me get your take uh, on Syria as we are talking uh, conflict and this region. What happens next? Well, I think there was, uh, in the last few days, something very important. The opposition met in Riyadh, and they were able to come with a unified proposal for uh, representation of the uh, opposition in the Geneva Conference. Uh, we had in Astana, an important moment in which uh, the armed groups, uh, together with the Syrian government and the, with the mediation of uh, Russia, Turkey and uh, Iran, um, were able to come to a ceasefire, and let's hope that ceasefire is sustainable. But uh, there is no solution for the Syrian problem without a comprehensive political solution in which all Syrians feel they are properly represented. Uh, and, and more, uh, everybody is extremely concerned with Daesh and with the terrorism and uh, with the impact of Daesh uh, in global security. There is no way we can fight terrorism if at the same time we don't find the political solutions for the crisis situations that today feed terrorism. So to make sure that in Geneva we have substantive discussions and that they are a first step, I don't expect a miracle, they are a first step for a serious progress in finding a transition that allows for a political solution in which all Syrians feel represented is, I believe, extremely important for the Syrian people, extremely important for the stability of the region, extremely important for our global security, and the key instrument in fighting terrorism, and namely in fighting Daesh. You talked to the issue of inequality, uh, a deficit in trust, and in social cohesion 2016 I think we will all agree in this room was a chaotic year um, we have a new US administration are you confident it supports in its America first um, pitch as it were the very core values of the United Nations that of multilateralism are you I, concerned I think we need to distinguish uh, the problems that you have mentioned first, mm. uh, uh, and uh, the relationship with an administration in the country. Mm. Uh, my position about the way the UN needs to deal with the US administration is very simple. The UN needs to respect its principles, but at the same time, the UN needs to, to engage constructively with the US administration, as with any other administration in the world. Mm. The US is a key partner in world affairs, and it would be a mistake to uh, just uh, undermine this relationship based on any kind of prejudice. No, there's no prejudice. Let's take things for its face value and let's do everything possible to make this relationship a constructive relationship. Mm -hmm. Having said so, we need to respect our values and we need to make sure that a, a multilateral approach for the solution of global problems uh, is uh, uh, valued. Um, and there, uh, there are the aspects that you were mentioning. Uh, indeed, uh, um, one of the reasons of these mistrust uh, between people and the institutions has to do with uh, some of the factors you mentioned. I mean, inequality, globalization, and technological progress have also contributed to the increase in, of inequality. Eight people in the world has as much wealth as half of the world population. Mm. This is a reality. And uh, if one looks at uh, countries, and this was true in the United States, it's true in Europe and in other parts of the world, uh, in which uh, uh, we have seen uh, progress, but in which large parts of the population have not benefited, and uh, uh, creating anxiety, jobs being lost, uh, new jobs being of different nature, people in middle age being difficult to adapt to those new jobs, the Rust Belt in the United States, many areas in Europe, many areas uh, around the world. Um, uh, and then, uh, 
if one looks at what has happened uh, in Europe last year with the, uh, the migration and refugee movements, and the fact that there was a total lack of capacity of European countries to come together and to have a European solution. And so, without proper reception capacity, without uh, distribution, a fair distribution among states, you, you saw this crowd moving through the Balkans, giving the impression that there was an invasion, which was not the case. We were talking about 2% of the European population. There are 30% of refugees in Lebanon. So clearly, two things out of proportion. But this kind of um, uh, inability of governments to come together and manage these problems create the sense in many sectors of the population that they are abandoned, mm -hmm. that nobody is in charge, uh, that they, they must be afraid for themselves, for their future. And this is the best ground for populists, for xenophobes, uh, mm -hmm. for those that develop uh, forms of uh, anti-Muslim hatred or anti-Semitism or whatever, to, um, to play a role uh, in our societies. And I think that it is not enough to condemn um, xenophobia, it's not enough to condemn populism. I think we need to be able to engage in addressing the root causes that lead to the fact that to be populist is so simple in today's world. We're timing out here. I'm going to give you the very last word briefly. Uh, I know it, things are challenging. I know you must be delighted, in inverted commas, you have this job. The very best of luck. Are you optimistic? going forward. <laughs> well, you said a, a very nice sentence about me, but uh, in relation to those issues, I follow uh, Jean Monnet. Jean Monnet was one of the mm. fathers of the European Union, and uh, when asked if he was optimistic, he, he always would say the same, and I would repeat it. I'm not optimistic, I'm not pessimistic, I'm just determined. Thank you very much. <laughs> and with that, we thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.